So agrarian cultures mark the beginning of civilization, at least according to history and anthropology. That's where civilization begins once people live in settled villages or cities and they're able to produce enough food because of their agrarian advancements that now people can specialize in labor. Some people can now be educators, some people can be doctors, other people can be security or military, other people can be priests, other people can rule or be the bureaucracy. And so this is where we get the beginning of written language and that is where society, at least our book and history says, that's when civilization begins. And so if we look around the world, it is kind of uncanny. We find most cult of these ancient river valley agrarian cultures begin to have written records about 3500 BCE. So agrarian cultures, the living in city where specialized labor could be performed. These included professional priestly caste, scribes with writing, tool makers, craftsmen, artists, professional military bureaucracy, etc. At the same time that we've gone from horticulture to more intensive agriculture to mechanized agriculture, like in our society, these whole societies were being developed over pastoralism where they wouldn't settle in one place, but these were like herds people, where they would raise sheep or goats or horses or camels, and they would travel with their herds. And I just find this incredibly fascinating when you think about the difference between like a sedentary agrarian culture and a nomadic herd culture. And think of the different technology they're going to need, the different skill sets they're going to have to have to survive, um, but a lot of these nomadic and agrarian cultures were able to work out sort of like a symbiotic relationship because the herd cultures were migratory. They would come and go in different regions where the agrarian people are sedentary. Because they're sedentary, they can do things like manufacture goods, do metallurgy, have kilns, make pottery, um, have looms, things that a nomadic group is probably not going to be able to carry on their journeys. But the nomadic people are going to have things like meat and milk and cheese and leather and fur and wool, and they can barter and trade these things with these domestic agrarian people for items that the nomadic people can't produce. And so in this sense, they could get along. And there's there's actually a quite famous example of this in the country of Rwanda, where you had the Tutsis and the Hutsu, I mean the Tutsus and the Hutsis. And when the French came into Awana, Rwanda and colonized it, they assumed that the Tutsus were more noble. And I hope I'm not butchering these names. I apologize if you're from Rwanda and, and I am. But the Tutsus, they looked more European, even though they were African people, they were dark in complexion, they had higher cheekbones, thinner noses and lips, um, taller and more slender. And so the French overlords put the Tutsus, these nomadic people in charge, even though they were only like 10% of the population, which caused a lot of resentment ab among the more agrarian Hutsis, who had these nomadic groups put in leaderships of bureaucracy, government, etc. And so when the French finally left and gave the country back to the Rwandans, first of all, the French and the, the British, the Spanish, the Portuguese, Germans made artificial lines. Like there is no country of Rwanda, but you had these agrarian people groups living in a Central African region and you had this nomadic group moving in and out of that region. But the Europeans came in and basically divvied up this country. And now all of a sudden, maybe the Tutsus nomadic wanderings would take them through three or four different countries. It's not like they're just staying within Rwanda. The agrarian people are settled, right? But what if there was a band of that tribe in the neighboring country? They're now cut off and seen as a different people group 
because they're no longer in the artificial constructs. Anyways, long story short, when the French left, there was a revolt among the Hootsies against the Tutsus. And in fact, it was trying to be almost like a full-scale genocide where the Hootsies were going in and slaughtering the Tutsus. The Tutsus were able to flee into neighboring countries. They were able to reorganize, militarize, and were able to come back in and take back over the country. And part of this happened because of this imposition that was brought from the outside, where you took two people groups who had been living in a symbiotic relationship, and now that they were put in this artificial constraints and hierarchies, it caused a lot of resentment later on in that country's history. Um, I'm not quite sure how Rwanda's doing now, but I hope they have found some way to live in peace. 